Hello, everybody. I think we'll get started now. Uh, my name is, welcome to uh, our Lunch and Learn. My name is Michelle Snow. I'm patient education librarian here at Princess Margaret Cancer Center, and I will be introducing our speaker today. Jean Lamentia is a registered dietitian, cancer survivor, and best-selling author of the book, which is right here, The Essential Cancer Treatment Nutrition Guide and Cookbook. Uh, Jean also writes a monthly blog called Cancer Bites, and you can subscribe to the blog at www.jeanlamentia.com. I believe it's on this first slide here. Yes, at the bottom. Um, Jean provides peace of mind through one-on-one -on -one and group mentorship to cancer patients, survivors, and people in high risk for cancer. So please join me in welcoming Jean Lamenta. Thank you, Michelle. And I want to thank uh, Michelle and her team for inviting me here today. And I just really want to start by telling you my story. Is this on, too? Can you hear me? And when I was 27 years old, something happened to me that really changed my life. And at the time, I felt like the rug was pulled out from under me. And I wasn't sure that I was going to survive. But, you know, with time, I've begun to see the experience as, as a gift because it really has shaped my, my career. And when I was 27 years old, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, stage 2B. I had masses in my neck, under my arms, and I had a tumor the size of a small grapefruit growing in the middle of my chest. By the time I reached the cancer center, my lungs were so full of lymphatic fluid that it felt like I was drowning in my own body. And I received my diagnosis and I started six months of chemotherapy, followed by a month of daily radiation. And it was really a, a turning point for me at the end of my treatment. Because this is what I thought. When it was my very last day of radiation, I actually thought my radiation oncologist was going to meet me there at the radiation suite when I came out. He was going to shake my hand and he was going to say, you did it. You finished your treatment, your cancer's gone, you're cured. And most of you probably know it doesn't work that way, right? There was no fanfare, no doctor, no special treatment from the radiation techs. All I had was an appointment card. So I thought, okay, that's when the doctor's going to tell me. So I go for that three-month appointment. They took a chest x-ray. They did blood work. Uh, they weighed me. They did a physical exam. And they said, okay, see you back in three months. And this began a real roller coaster cycle for me. Relief that I didn't have cancer that day but a gradual buildup of anxiety and fear before my next three month follow up. Because I thought I could say, it, today it's back, right? And, you know, what occurred to me during this time is that my medical team was expert at treating my cancer, and they were expert at detecting my cancer, but they were not expert at helping to me to reduce my risk. Reduce my risk of a recurrence of my Hodgkin's and also reduce my risk of the cancers that they told me, in my case, lung cancer and breast cancer that I was now high risk for because of my treatment. And if I was doing something to help myself, I didn't know what it was. So in that way, it didn't help with my fear. And this fear really reached a peak. And that peak happened, actually, as I'm trying to get my life back on track. And, you know, when you're 20-something, you go out with your friends and you have a drink, right? So I had my first drink of alcohol since my cancer diagnosis and treatment. And I got a headache. Now, it might not seem like a big deal, but let me backtrack for you a year and a half before. My cancer started as a pain in the neck. That's all it was. It felt like a stiff neck. But the interesting thing about this stiff neck was that whenever I had alcohol, the pain in that stiff neck would increase, radiate down my arm into my hand. And at the time, 
I was actually working at a diabetes education center, and another dietitian and I used to go out and shoot pool and drink beer. <laughs> so there goes a little secret. Dietitians do shoot pool and drink beer. <laughs> and when I was finally diagnosed seven months later, and I started researching my type of cancer, one thing caught my eye. It said, this cancer sometimes reacts to alcohol. And I knew exactly what that was because I had experienced that pain shooting down my arm into my hand. So now fast forward to the place that I was, having my first drink of alcohol after my cancer treatment finished, having a headache, you know, spiraling in fear and anxiety. Where does that lead me? Oh my God, I've got brain mess. That's where I went with that. So I was so convinced that I had brain mats. I called the cancer center when I had my treatment and I asked them to page the oncology resident on call and I carefully explained, I'm a Hodgkin's patient, I've finished my treatment, I just had my first glass of alcohol and now I have a headache. I think I've got brain mats. And he laughed at me. And it was deeply humiliating. And the fact that my fear was not listened to and heard really, um, it really hurt. But at the same time, it was one of those moments, have you ever had these moments where you look in the mirror and you see yourself? In my moment, I said, Jean, you've got to get a grip. I recognized that my fear was out of control and my anxiety was out of control and I had to do something. My medical team, I could see their expertise, as I said, was in treating my cancer and detecting my cancer. It was not in helping me reduce my risk. My medical oncologist told me, just eat a healthy diet. Well, I knew what that was because I was already a dietitian. And of course, this flashed into my mind, right? Canada's food guide. I learned about this in my first year at university. But what do I know about this? Is that this is a tool for the general healthy population. And thinking of this did nothing to reduce my fear because I thought, I need to do more than that. I've already had cancer once and I'm high risk for two other types of cancer. It just didn't feel like enough. And it didn't feel like it was going to do anything to break through my fear and anxiety that I was having. And in that moment, you know, that moment of humiliation, kind of talked to myself and, you know, I feel that I have to figure this out. I had to do something to help myself in this situation. And to be honest, I didn't have to look too far because here's my degree from the University of Guelph. I graduated Applied Human Nutrition, and I had a clinical dietetic internship from the Toronto Western Hospital. If you're going to pick someone who's going to be qualified to be a cancer patient, it was me, right? So I started looking at the research, and I haven't stopped since. And I'm going to distill that information down for you today into three keys that I think you should focus on as someone who's finished your cancer treatment and want to reduce your risk. Now, I can't share everything that I've learned over the years, but I'll do my best to give you some real tools that you can implement today, okay? And if you want more, there's plenty of ways to get in touch with me and work with me either one-on-one -on -one or group or online. And, you know, it's important. You might think, oh, it's just it's fear, it's anxiety. But think about it this way. Your fear can actually compromise your immune system. Your immune system is one of the things that can help protect you from cancer. So the very thing that you're fearing you're actually creating an environment that would allow that to, to take hold. The other thing that was happening in my case, the night before one of these three month follow-up appointments, I developed my first migraine headache. I had never had a migraine before. 
And I developed the migraine because I was so afraid that when I went back to that follow-up appointment, the doctor was going to tell me my cancer was back. Now, not everybody gets migraine headaches from their fear and their anxiety and their stress level. Some people develop high blood pressure. Some have an angina. Uh, some have heartburn. Some have irritable bowel symptoms like diarrhea, constipation, or bloating. Some have skin problems like eczema or rashes. So my fear was so out of control that I was this hypervigilant person thinking every headache was a cancer spread. And I was also creating new illness. In my case, migraine headaches I've never had before. Okay, so it was really starting to affect my health. So here are the three keys that I want you to hold on to. And remember that these are your tools that you can use. And when you implement these, my wish is that the fear and the anxiety about recurrence and about new cancer will start to diminish because you realize there's evidence that these things can help me, okay? So the three keys are, first one is to support the immune system. And I'm going to tell you how to do that. The second one is to reduce chronic inflammation. And the third one is to eat the foods and the nutrients that can act on cancer cells directly. Okay? So let's start with the first one. Support the immune system. Now nutrition can do this. I wrote a whole six-part blog series on the nutrients that can help support the immune system. Vitamin B6 is one of them. Vitamin E is another. Beta-glucan is one. The isoflavones found in soy. I only have a limited time here today, so I won't go into detail on those, but you can please read them on my blog, okay? But the first one I want to talk about, and it's, you kind of get an idea of it, and that is stress management, okay? I'm just going to switch. Can I just set that down? So, last year we were in, uh, in the U.S. on vacation and checking out at the grocery store, and my daughter sees this magazine, and she asked me, Mommy, can we get this? So I said, okay. Popular science magazine for a seven-year-old, but anyway. Of course, you can see why she wanted to get it, because she thought it was all about Lego, right? So we get the magazine, and it's all about stress. And... You know, I just want to say when I'm putting my information together, it is all evidence-based, and I get that from the, the published medical literature. Not always from popular science, but... One thing I wanted to point out, just in the opening, it says, chronic stress has been linked to illnesses such as cancer and diabetes. And the medical literature supports this, too, that there is definitely a link between stress and cancer. But then a few pages in... I think the magazine really got it wrong. And let me read you what it says in here. So they're profiling a comedian by the name of Tig Notaro. And it said, Tig Notaro had a famously stressful year in 2012. Within months, she got pneumonia, an intestinal infection, went through a breakup, her mom died unexpectedly, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Now, I would write that differently. I would say, comedian Tig Notaro have a famously stressful year in 2012. Within months, she got pneumonia, an intestinal infection, went through a breakup, her mom died unexpectedly. And because of the stress of all these things, the individual cancer cells that are in her body were allowed to grow into the size of a mass that was actually detectable because of her compromised immune system due to her high stress levels. Maybe the editor would have to make that sound a little better. But we've heard the expression, it never rains but it pours, right? And maybe in your experience with cancer you've had this, or maybe you know someone, but it's not uncommon to have, you know, pick something from that person's list, right? Uh, a divorce, a breakup, a death of someone close, maybe even it's a pet or a family member. 
uh, forced retirement, all kinds of things can precede a diagnosis of cancer. And let's not underestimate the effect that that stress has on the immune system and what a great partner our immune system can be in helping to protect us from cancer. So it's not surprising that one of the ways to support the immune system is to do regular stress management. Now, this doesn't prevent your stress levels, your fight or flight reaction from occurring when one of these stressful life events happens. But when you're practicing regular stress reduction, you're more likely to, to go to that, right? So if you're used to going to yoga a couple of times a week, or if you're used to doing exercise or meditation, you're going to have that tool and you're going to know how to use it, okay? Not to mention it's good for just, you know, the stress that comes from just a regular boring old week, right? So stress management is one of the keys. Another one is physical activity. Now, not all types of physical activity actually support the immune system. Some of it compromises it, and I'll give you my own personal experience with this. When I was finished my cancer treatment, I was very out of shape. I had spent probably the first three months of my chemo just vomiting, and I lost a lot of muscle. And so several months after my treatment, I thought, I'm going to get back in shape. I went to the track at U of T, inside track, and I could run halfway around. That's it. But anyway, I just kept going, kept going, kept going. And eventually, I found myself at the starting line of my first half marathon. So I made all the rookie mistakes. I didn't fuel properly the night before. I didn't hydrate enough during the race. I started off too fast. By the end of it, I was having chills. I was having dehydration. And it was everything I could do to just push myself and get over that finish line. So what happened to me the next day? Any guesses? I got sick, right? I got sick. Because that's kind of really high intensity exercise where you're not listening to your body is compromising the immune system. The type that's supporting the immune system is regular, moderate physical activity, okay? And you want to be doing this every day if you can. So that's the second tool. Another one is being out in nature. Now, as I said, all my information I've given you today is evidence-based. But I'll tell you, with this information, there's only a handful of studies, and they all come from Japan. And in Japan, they have a practice called forest bathing, where they go into the forest, and on these studies, they'll measure people's natural killer cells, which are certain cells part of the immune system, before and after they're in the forest. And what they find is the level of these protective cells goes up. And what they believe is happening here is that the trees are giving off natural wood aromatherapy that's affecting the immune system in a positive way, okay? And I think it's really nice if you tie those three together, stress reduction, physical activity, and being outside, right? Being around trees. And to know also that these are supportive of the immune system. Now, you might have been doing this stuff already, but again, I think knowing that it helps is what's going to help reduce your fear, okay? Because otherwise you might be thinking, there's nothing I can do. I'm just randomly waiting for this to know if this cancer is coming back or not. Another thing that can support the immune system is laughter. And in the research on this, they'll help people read a funny story or watch a funny movie, and they measure the effect on the immune system, and there's a positive effect. But you know what? Even if you laugh and there's nothing funny about it, it still has a positive effect on the immune system. Now, who would laugh when there's nothing funny to laugh at? Well, people who go to laughter yoga. Have you heard of this? So nothing funny about it. You go like a regular yoga class, and at some point the instructor's going to ask you, take a deep breath and let's do a big belly laugh. <laughs> And it sound, feels ridiculous, to be honest, at the beginning. And then it just kind of takes on a life of its own and starts laughing. Even this kind of laughter is supportive of the immune system. Okay? And another one I'll give you today, and that is sleep. 
No surprise, sleep is very restorative to the immune system, like it is to the musculoskeletal system and the neuroendocrine system. But there's a couple of keys to pay attention to, and that is the amount of sleep. Between seven and eight hours of sleep a night is ideal. But also the time at which you go to sleep. And if you can be asleep between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m., that sort of magic window, that is especially supportive of the immune system. So if you're pulling an all-nighter and you think, I'm just going to sleep eight hours now and sleep until 11, that's not the same thing. Okay, so it's not just the number of hours, but also the time that you get to sleep. So that's the first key, supporting the immune system. And those are just an overview of some of the tools that you can use to help you do that, okay? The next one I want to talk about is reducing chronic inflammation. And, you know, people can think about inflammation as, you know, I've got tonsillitis. Anytime you have itis on the end of the word, that's inflammation. Or appendicitis, right? Um, gastritis. But the kind of inflammation I'm talking about here, you may not even know that you have it in your body. Now, there are ways to tell if you have it, and you can measure it in a blood test. One of them, for example, is called CRP, C-reactive protein. Another one is called IL-6. So let me share with you an analogy that I've developed to help you understand what is chronic inflammation. So let's say you get up in the morning and you look out and you've got a view of the street and you see there's a car accident right in front of your house. So you're going to pick up the phone and you're going to call 911. What's going to happen? The first responders are going to show up, okay? So the ambulance attendants are going to help people that are injured. Uh, the police are going to, you know, order the tow truck and get the traffic moving again. The fire truck are going to clean up any fuel spill or put out any fire. And then they're going to leave. And then you look out in your street a couple of hours later and you're not even going to be able to tell that there was a problem there. Think of that as acute inflammation. Acute meaning short term. Okay? So you cut your finger, it's like dialing cellular 911. The first responders come, and these are specialized cells that fix the problem, okay? And then leave, and everything gets back to normal. But what about in that analogy, when you call 911 and those first responders come to the car accident, but then they don't leave? Then what happens? Well, the injured patient is, is not going to get to the hospital or get where they need, right? It's going to be a lot of looky-loos coming, like, what's going on, you know? It's going to be hard to get down the sidewalk because everyone's going to be trying to figure out what's happening, right? Then the traffic's going to get backed up. The cars are not going to get down the street. And then garbage day, well, the garbage is going to start to pile up. And what was once a very functional, healthy system has now created all kinds of dysfunction and disease. So you create all new problems. There's going to be rats. There's going to be, you know, all kind of, you know, more car accidents. The, the street isn't even going to be usable anymore, right? Think of that as chronic inflammation. So what once was a very healthy cellular reaction inside your body meant to, you know, either get rid of a foreign body or get rid of a virus or bacteria or heal you know, a sunburn, um, or heal some other sort of radiation. If those cellular 911 first responders don't leave, it's creating dysfunction. And within that dysfunction, it's allowing the creation of a cancer cell. One cell. That's all it takes to start this process. Okay? So... A tool in your toolbox is to reduce chronic inflammation. So how do we do that? I told you that you can have a blood test. And there's no point really in testing your blood unless you know you can do something about it, unless you can track that and, you know, three months later, six months later, see that number come down. And there is things you can do about it. 
Number one, of course, because I'm a dietitian, I'm going to tell you about the diet stuff first. So there are foods that are anti-inflammatory. And there's a study published a couple years ago where the researchers looked at 40 different food components, micronutrients, macronutrients, vitamins, um, herbs and spices, and they rank them. Which is the strongest anti-inflammatory? And the number one anti-inflammatory, any guesses? Omega-3 fatty acid. Okay? So what do you, most people think of when they hear omega-3 fatty acid? Cold water fish, right? Salmon, sardines, herring, mackerel, anchovies. Okay? Also, maybe not the first thing to your mind, but ground flax seeds, flax oil, walnuts. There's not a lot of dietary sources of omega-3 fatty acid. So you really have to pay attention to your diet to make sure you're including those. The number two anti-inflammatory, turmeric, that yellow spice. That's why we hear so much about turmeric, okay? And you will find that in yellow curry. But it's quite likely that that has, you know, a lot to do with, or at least plays a role in why people in South Asian countries who use turmeric on a regular basis have lower rates of the cancers that are so prevalent in North America. Number three, four, and five, garlic, ginger, tea. Green tea, black tea, doesn't matter, okay? So those are just the top five anti-inflammatories, and you want to make sure that you're including these in your diet. The other thing to pay attention to, though, is the fact that you can get too much of a good thing. So even if your diet is healthy, if you're overeating, that can be an inflammatory situation, okay? So you want to find the portions that work for you so that you can be lean. Now, how lean? The American Institute for Cancer Research says you should be as lean as possible without being underweight. That's pretty lean, okay? Now, getting back to the lean bit, one of the reasons for that is that, you know, there are a couple of, several types of fat that we carry in our bodies, two main ones. One is called subcutaneous fat, and that's why if you've ever had an injection, sometimes it's called a sub-Q, that stands for subcutaneous. And that's the kind of fat that's, you know, in our arms, or maybe on our thighs, or our, on our buttocks. And then there's visceral fat. Visceral fat is the type of fat that's packed in the abdominal cavity, between the organs, right? And that's why you may have come across in the research that you're doing that waist circumference is a risk factor, okay? Because when you measure your waist circumference with a tape measure, you're getting an indication of how much visceral fat you have on your body. And visceral fat is dangerous because it produces inflammatory cytokines, or in other words, inflammatory messengers. It creates, it's a source of inflammation in the body as well. It can be, it can also produce hormones like estrogen, okay? So you want to include the anti-inflammatory foods, but in the right portion so that you're getting lean, okay? Particularly if where you're carrying your body fat is in the lower abdominal region. And you also want to participate in regular, moderate physical activity, just like to support the immune system, okay? So, we talked about two of the keys. One, support the immune system. Two, reduce chronic inflammation. I want to talk to you now about the third one, and I'm going to switch over to the slides. So, how do I advance the... Oh, is it this? Oh, okay. All right. And I think I have a pointer here. Yeah. Okay. So this is, hmm, if I do, okay. This is the life cycle 
of a cancer cell. It begins here with inflammation. Remember I said chronic inflammation creates that really bad neighborhood, right? That neighborhood that allows a cancer cell really to come into existence because part of what these cellular first responders are doing is saying, you're damaged, get out of here. You need to replicate yourself and create create a new cell that's gonna replace this damaged cell. Well, when there's a high turnover like that, more new cells coming into existence, it's just a greater statistical likelihood that one's gonna come into existence that has a defect. And that defect is going to allow it also to survive when a normal cell should just have a certain lifespan and then die off and replace itself. So this damaged cell now, this cancer cell, is going to survive. It's going to proliferate. It's going to invade the tissue. Then it really gets rolling here, the angiogenesis, where it creates its own blood supply. And then metastases or spread. Now there's one thing I'm going to put in the middle here of this slide that can help at all of these stages, and that is nutraceuticals. You may not have heard of this word, but you can probably figure out what it means. It comes from the word nutrition and pharmaceutical. So they are food or food components that have a pharmaceutical action. And I'm going to introduce you to three of them today. The first one, garlic. I even brought some with me. Now, I'm going to give you a little chemistry lesson. This garlic doesn't smell like garlic. When does the garlic smell like garlic? It's not until after you put it through your crusher, right? Or until you chop it up, smash it on the cutting board. And that's because the compound that creates the garlic smell is not in there. There is an enzyme that is in one little cell membrane or in, inside one area and a naturally present precursor. And when you crush it or put it, you know, break it apart, these two components now can react. Because before they were in their own little, own little area. And they can create a new component. And this is when you smell the garlic, okay? It's allicin that has the aromatic qualities that we associate with garlic. And then that breaks down into other compounds. And these are the ones that actually have an effect on cancer cells, okay? Now, what effect do they have? Well, first of all, let me say, to maximize that reaction, there's a researcher in the US who found that when you crush it or break open that garlic, you wanna leave it for 10 minutes before you eat it or before you cook it to maximize that chemical reaction that's gonna take place, okay? So you want to just set it to the side of your cutting board and go ahead and cut up your onion and your celery and whatever else you're putting in your recipe. And then you put it in the pot. Remember that life cycle of the cancer cell I showed you? So the researchers who do work on this, what they do is they have a Petri dish with lung cancer cells or breast cancer cells or colon cancer cells in it. And they put in extract of garlic or they maybe even isolate specifically for what they think is the active ingredient, the allicin or some of the other compounds. And they watch, what is happening to this cancer cell? Will the garlic is stopping the inflammation, it's stopping the invasion, and it's stopping the angiogenesis. So three places on the life cycle of that cancer cell where the garlic compound is interfering. Now, I want to tell you that 
just because this happens in a petri dish in a laboratory, we can't say for sure that this is happening in our own body. Okay? But what are the downsides of you know acting on this information? Okay, bad breath. All right. But besides that, right? Like there's not you always do have to weigh your cost benefit ratio and I think the potential benefit here is, is pretty good if, if this is doing this. And we do have support in other areas of research because we have trials where they put people on a Mediterranean diet, traditional Mediterranean diet, which is going to include garlic probably every day, right? And we know that the traditional Mediterranean diet is one diet that can help to reduce cancer risk. So we have evidence from sort of two sides of the spectrum. We don't have a clinical trial where they put half the people on garlic every day and half the people without, you know, follow them for five years or 10 years to see what happens. But we have good laboratory work. The next one I want to talk to you about is this one. What's that? Ginger. Yeah, ginger. Okay, now look at this. So we already knew it was anti-inflammatory. It can also stop cell proliferation, invasion, whoops, angiogenesis, and spread or metastases. Okay? And people often ask me, well, how do I include ginger in my diet? Because it's not, you know, that I didn't grow up on that. And a simple way to do it is really just to make ginger tea. Just get Ginger, you can even peel it with a spoon, make some rough chunks, put it in a mug, add some boiling water and you drink it, okay? You can also julienne the ginger, fry it, and it makes a nice topping on salads or stews, things like that. And you saw the sneak peek here. The third group, this is a whole family called the cruciferous family, also called the mustard family. Now, there's another chemistry lesson I want to give you here. So, a little more complicated than the garlic, but same kind of idea. So, the cancer-fighting ingredient, let's use broccoli as an example, is not in that bunch of broccoli. But when you snap off you know, your piece of broccoli, you are breaking those membranes and allowing, again, an enzyme. In this case, I will say myrosinase, but some say myrosirinase, to meet up with a group of compounds. Now, this is different depending on if you're eating cabbage or Brussels sprouts or cauliflower broccoli. And it creates an end product. And in the case of broccoli, the end product is called sulforaphane. And I'm not sure if you are familiar with Dr. Richard Bellivo from the University of Quebec. He published a very good book called Foods That Fight Cancer. He calls sulforaphane the most important nutrient in the fight against cancer. And by extension, broccoli, the most important food in the fight against cancer. So this is some pretty important stuff. Now, there's another reaction that can take place when you cut that broccoli. And that is the enzyme, the myrosinase, can meet up with a protein and it can create an inert compound. Useless. So we go from this reaction where we create the most powerful cancer-fighting compound to this where we create a dud, right? So how do we get rid of this protein, but keep the myrosinase enzyme? Well, the answer is you cook it. And I know this is contrary to people who support that raw food is the only way to go, and anytime you cook your food, you're making it less nutritious. And we know that's not true from lycopene in tomato products, right? Because the recommendation is always to have processed tomato products like tomato sauce or tomato soup, right? 
And now we can add the cruciferous family to that list of foods that are actually better cooked. Now, there's a researcher who studies broccoli. And what she discovered is that to destroy the protein that's going to take it to the inert end product, you need to either boil it for 30 seconds or steam it for three minutes. That's it. That's all it takes. And if you do that, if you steam your broccoli for three minutes and you still put it out on a crudite, it's going to be nice and green and crispy. It's not going to be uh, soggy. Now, how much is too much? Because we don't want to destroy the morosinase enzyme. So you want to steam it no more than three minutes. Okay? So, or sorry, you want to boil it for no more than one minute, steam it for no more than five. So if you're boiling, the window is between 30 seconds and a minute. It's hardly worth getting the pot out for it, right? <laughs> Steam it between three minutes and five minutes, okay? That's your magic window. Now let's say, uh-oh, I've overcooked it. Is, is there any nutrition left in here? So what you've done is you've destroyed the enzyme. But guess what? That enzyme is in other foods that belong to that family. Open up your fridge and get out the mustard. Wasabi mustard or, you know, grainy mustard or get out your Keen's mustard powder from the spice cupboard. That contains the enzyme, okay? Or if you've got another broccoli in the fridge or a piece of cabbage or kale, you break a piece of that off and you eat it when you eat your overcooked broccoli, okay? Because that has the enzyme that you destroyed from overcooking, all right? Who thought science could be so practical, right? Now, why is this worth doing? Check this out. Every single stage in the life cycle of the cancer cell can be interrupted by the nutraceuticals that are found in the cruciferous family. It's very powerful. So, if you're experiencing a lot of fear, anxiety, I want you to know that there are tools that you can use to help you feel that there's that you're doing something to help reduce your risk. And you can support the immune system. You can reduce chronic inflammation. You can act on cancer cells directly by changes that you make in your lifestyle and by changes you make in your diet. So I'll take um, any other questions. I guess maybe outside, yeah, because there's another group coming in here, but I want to thank you for coming.